Hey STAT students, how you doing? Time for another STATS video. This one's going to be on sampling distributions. This is a, this is a fundamental topic. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy and it's kind of the cornerstone for uh, 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 inference, which is what we're going to start on our next, uh, our next video. So what are sampling distributions? Well, they're the probability models for sample proportions and sample means. Okay, so let's start with sample proportions and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? So uh, uh, we're going to look at, or we're going to pretend we're looking at the proportion of all Texas voters who want to raise the minimum wage, okay? And we're going to say that that's P, okay? P for proportion. Now P is a parameter because it's the proportion of all Texas voters in our population. Now P hat is our statistic, it's our sample statistic. It's the proportion of our sample that wants to raise the minimum wage. Okay? P hat, the statistic, is an estimator of P, the parameter. Because generally, you don't know the parameter. And so you have to use the, the uh, statistic to estimate the parameter. And what we're going to do with these uh, sampling distributions is we're going to see just how good an estimator this can be. Okay? Now, N is, uh, like always, the size of our sample. And uh, let's, uh, uh, let's recall a couple of things. First off, in order for us to uh, assume independence as we're taking this sample, n has got to be small enough, meaning it's got to be less than 10% of the entire uh, population. I don't think that's going to be a problem here because uh, there's a lot of Texas voters and I don't think I can ask 10% of them. That's just too many. So uh, that's, that's not an issue. And if you remember why this affects independence, it's a... Uh, Think of a deck of cards, okay? You start pulling out cards and you don't put them back. That's sampling without replacement. It changes the probability of getting a four or a queen or an ace or a heart, okay? Because you have fewer cards to choose from and, you, and the ones that you pulled out, well, they're no longer part of the mix, okay? Well, the same thing is true when we're talking to a, a, a population, when we're sampling from that population. It's just that it's true to a lesser extent because I'm talking about millions and millions of people here. If I go over to one person and I say, do you think the minimum wage ought to be uh, 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 raised? And that person says, yeah. Well, theoretically, my numerator and my denominator have both decreased by one, okay? I have one less person in that, in that population there because I'm taking that person out now. I'm not gonna ask him again. I have one less person that's, uh, that believes in raising the, the minimum wage and I also have one less person in the population. But the fact is, if those numbers are huge, eh, big deal, okay? It just doesn't matter. And what statisticians have found is, if the numbers are, if you ask less than 10% of people, it's just not gonna, sure you've affected independence, but not enough to really make it meaningful, okay? So that's the first thing that we recalled. I realize I went on a really long explanation and I've already done it before, but it's important. And then X has gotta be, I mean, sorry, N has gotta be big enough it's got to be big enough for n times p and n times q to both be greater than or equal to 10, okay? And the reason we need that is because we're not going to use, we're, we're going to kind of use the binomial model, but really what we're going to use is the normal model, okay? And in order for the normal model to be a good approximation for the binomial model, uh, n, and p, n times p and n times q have both got to be at least 10. Now, some of y'all may be quite bright, you may be pretty sharp, you may be pretty clever, and you may be thinking to yourselves, hey, if I don't know what P is, how do I know if N times P and N times Q are both greater than or equal to 10? My answer to you is, that's a really good question, okay? You should pat yourself on the back. That was, a, uh, that was smart thinking on your part. I'm not going to answer that question right now. We'll get to it later on, but, uh, but still, be proud of that question. Now, let's get back to uh, what we're doing here. Uh, we're looking at the proportion of our sample that wants to raise the minimum wage. Okay, so we, got, we, ask, we ask a bunch of people, and X say yes. Okay, so that means that X is a binomial random variable that uh, has uh, 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 parameters N and P. N is our sample size. P is the probability of each person answering yes or no. Okay? Uh, we know some things about binomial random variables. We know that the expected value of x is n times p. We know that the standard deviation of x is the square root of npq, the square root of the variance. And uh, because our, uh, our n is big enough, that means x can also be described as a normally distributed random variable, 
with a mean of NP and a standard deviation of NPQ. Okay. Now, one thing. Uh, with, now let's look at a uh, let's look at what p hat is. Okay, p hat is it's the proportion of our sample that wants to raise the minimum wage. Meaning, it's the number of successes, the number of yeses, divided by the number uh, in our sample itself, x over n, which can also be described as one times one over n times x. Now, if you remember. Uh, if I take a constant times a random variable, that gets me another random variable. Okay? Not only that, if, uh, if this random variable is normally distributed, that means this random variable is also going to be normally distributed. Okay? And, and if you think about it, this actually makes sense that p hat would be a random variable because it, it depends entirely on what sample I happen to take. And, uh, and which sample I take is a random uh, uh, event. And any value that depends on a random event is, I think that's what the definition of a random variable is, isn't it? Yeah, sure, sure it is. Okay, so if it's a random variable, that means we can find the mean and the standard deviation of it. So first, let's look at the mean. Uh, that's the expected value. It's going to be 1 over n times the mean of x. And the mean of x is n times p. So that means it's 1 over n times np. That's just p. All right, again, this makes perfect sense because p hat is estimating p. If p hat is estimating p, then the average of all my p hats out there really should be p. Okay. Now let's look at the standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation of p hat is going to be 1 over n times the standard deviation of x. And the standard deviation of x was square root of npq. So that means it's 1 over n times the square root of npq. And uh, if we cancel out our n's there, well, cancel out the square root of the n, we get the square root of pq over n. Okay. And that means that p hat is normally distributed with a mean of p and a standard deviation of pq over n. If you haven't written this down by now, pause the video, write that down. It's important. Okay? So, what does all this mean? It means that p hat follows a normal model. Okay? It's going to have a normal curve there. 68% uh, uh, of our p hats, meaning when I take my sample, uh, there's a 68% probability that uh, that that my uh, uh, that my p hat is going to be between uh, p minus the square root of pq over n and p plus the square root of pq over n, and a 95% chance it's going to be within two standard deviations, etc. And uh, uh, let's put some real numbers on this, okay? Let's say let's say that I went out and I asked 200 people, and let's also say. The truth of the matter is, I got no clue how many Texans want to uh, raise the minimum wage. So I just figured, to not upset anybody, to not offend anybody, I'm just going to choose the number right in the middle. And I'm going to say 50%. Okay? So 50% say yes, 50% say no. Again, I don't know, so don't call me up and say, you don't know what you're talking about. In this particular case, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about. But we're just going to assume it's 0.5 for now. So n is 200, p is 0.5. And I go out and I, uh, uh, I do my sample. So what this says is there's a 68% probability that my p hat, my sample proportion, will be between 0.465 and 0.535. There's a 95% uh, uh, probability that my p hat's going to be between 0.429 and 0.571. There's a 99.7% probability, extremely likely, that it'll be between 0.5 394 and 0.606. So if you think to yourself, well, shoot, even though the population uh, 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 the proportion is 0.5, you're only asking 200 people. You could, you know, get a weird sample, and your uh, your sample proportion might be as low as 20, you know, 20 percent. Well, what this is telling us is, <laughs> no, no, that's not going to happen. Okay, that's just that's just crazily unlikely. Uh, really, what's going to happen is it's going to be it's almost certain that it's going to be between 40 and 60 percent, and it's probably going to be a lot closer to 50 percent than that. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, but that's still too much variation. I, I, I want it to be more precise. Well, make that number grow then, okay? Go ask more people. Go ask 800 people, okay? And if you do that, now there's a 68 percent chance that it's going to be between 0.482 and 0.518, and a 95 percent chance it's going to be between 0.465 and 0.535. Now, some of you may be looking at that going, 
Hey, 0.535 and 0.465. Didn't we just see those numbers? Yeah, you did. Go back to the, to the 200, and there they are, 0.465 and 0.535. One standard deviation uh, before is now two standard deviations. So that means my standard deviation has been cut in half by asking 800 people instead of 200 people. Why is that, you ask? Well, there's a really good reason. Here's a standard deviation for 800 people, okay? P times Q over N, take the square root. Here, this radical is a standard deviation for 200 people. P times Q over 200, take the square root. Well, this, inside the, this, this variance inside the square root is obviously one-fourth of uh, this variance inside the square root. So that means by uh, it, when we pulled out the one-fourth, it just became one-half. And all that means is if you ask four times as many people, your standard deviation gets cut in half. Okay? If you ask nine times as many people, your standard, devi standard deviation gets cut into thirds. If you want your standard deviation to be cut into tenths, you have to ask a hundred times as many people, which might be financially difficult for you. Uh, but that's what you do. That is really the only thing you can do to uh, make your standard deviation uh, smaller. Okay? So those are sample proportions. Now let's talk about sample means. Sometimes when you go out and you're measuring something, you're not just measuring uh, the answer to a yes-no question. Uh, sometimes when you go out and measure something, you're actually getting a numerical answer back. Like, what's the average height of 16-year-old guys in Houston? What's the, uh, what's the average height of a live oak tree? Uh, what is, uh, um, what's the average mileage on cars being driven in Houston? There you go. That's a good one. So that would be mu, because it's the average of all the cars in Houston. The average mileage of all the cars in Houston. That's mu. That's our population mean. Okay? Uh, it's a number. I don't know what it is. It's greater than zero. It's, I'm sure it's less than 200,000. Uh, but uh, I don't know what it is. No clue. Okay? But I can take a sample. And X bar, I don't know why it's not mu hat. It should be mu hat. Once I'm in charge, it'll be mu hat, but it's X bar for now. X bar is the average mileage on cars in our particular sample. Okay? And again, N is going to be the size of our sample. Well, just like with our uh, sample proportions, we had some conditions, and if we don't meet the conditions, we have to just assume that they're right. Uh, we, had to, we had to assume that we're, we're gathering our data well. We had to assume the 10% the rule, which tells us that, uh, that uh, 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 there's independence among our, uh, the, the various members of our population. And we had to assume that the normal model was appropriate, and we did that by showing that NP and NQ were at least 10 you have almost the exact same uh, assumptions and conditions for uh, sample means. You still have to assume that you're, uh, or not assume, maybe ensure, that uh, your data was collected well. Uh, you still have to make sure that, uh, that you have independence. And generally, if your data is collected well, you're going to have independence, okay? But it's something that, that, uh, that, that must be uh, looked at. And then the population, Again, you have to assume that the normal, the, the, normal, ha, the normal model is appropriate, and the way you do that is by using a normally distributed population, or you use an N that is big enough. Okay, we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. Okay, so your sample means. Uh, what is X bar? X bar is the average of all of our X's. So I take one over N, and I multiply that times uh, the sum of all my x's, okay? Where each x, right now, I'm going to assume that my x's are normally distributed, okay? So each one of these x's is going to be normally distributed with a, a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, okay? Uh, now, what does that say about x bar? Because again, just like p hat is a, uh, is a random variable, x bar is also a random variable. And so the expected value of x bar is going to be 1 over n, times the expected value of, uh, of, of the sum of all these expected values. And since, uh, since all of these have the same expected value, mu, that means it's 1 over n times n times mu, and that's just mu. Again, this makes perfect sense because think about it. X bar is our sample, uh, our sample mean. It's the estimator 
of what mu is. The expected value of the estimator should be the thing that it's estimating. Okay? There's actually a term for this. It's called an unbiased estimator. Okay? Uh, now, let's look at the variance of x bar. The variance of x bar, now remember, x bar is 1 over n times the sum of all these random variables. Well, remember, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. So we're going to add up all these variances. And also remember that when you multiply a random variable times a constant, the variance of that is going to be that constant squared times the variance. Okay? So here, here we have 1 over n squared times the sum of all of our variances. All of those variances are the same. They're sigma squared. So that's going to be 1 over n squared times n sigma squareds. And uh, uh, canceling out one of our n's, what we end up with is sigma squared over n. And that just means that the standard deviation is going to be sigma over the square root of n. It's a little uh, 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 analogous to uh, our sample proportion. Okay? The standard deviation is sigma over the square root of n. And that means x bar is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma over the square root of n. Okay? So basically, the distribution of x bar is really similar to the distribution of x. It's just that your standard deviation got smaller by a factor of square root of n. Okay? Uh, so uh, I don't understand why that popped up there. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? It means that... Um, Let's say, again, wild guess here. Let's say that the average mileage is 80,000 with, uh, with a mean, uh, with a standard deviation of 36,000. Okay? Again, crazy guess. I'm sure that's not right, but let's just assume it is for now. Okay? If I go out and I take a sample of 100, that means my sample mean is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 80,000 and the standard deviation of 3,600. Why? I'm just dividing 36,000 by 10, by the square root of 100. If my sample size is 400, then I take my standard deviation, I divide it by the square root of 400, which is 20, and I'm going to get a normally distributed random variable uh, with a mean of 80,000 and a, uh, a standard deviation of 1,800. Okay? And if I ask, if I go out and measure 900 cars, then that means I would take that standard deviation and divide it by the square root of 900, which is 30, and I'll get the same mean, but now it's a standard deviation of only 1,200. Okay? So that means that uh, that's, that's actually fairly impressive. If I go check out 900 cars, I can make a really good estimate of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the mileage on every single car, the, the average mileage of every single car in Houston. Because if it really is 80,000 with a standard deviation of 36,000, then that means there's a 68% chance that my estimate is going to be between, what's that, 78,800 and uh, 81,200. That's, that's a, I think that, I'm impressed, okay? I think it's a fairly good estimate. Uh, and that's popping up again on the top again. I don't really understand that. I, okay, forgive me. Uh, now, we've been assuming that our x's are normally distributed, okay? And we assume that because if you add up a bunch of normally distributed uh, random variables, you get a normally distributed random variable. And if you uh, uh, and if you multiply a normally distributed random variable by a constant you get a normally distributed random variable. Uh, I don't think that the mileage of Houston cars is normally distributed. I'm thinking it's skewed. Well, let's think. There's a lot of cars that don't have many miles on them. Okay? A lot of people buy new cars fairly frequently. And there's a few cars out there that got a lot of miles on them. Okay? There's a few 200, even 300 thousand mile uh, cars. So I'm thinking that this is probably uh, uh, a distribution that is skewed way out here on the high end. It's skewed to the right. Uh, well, that's not normally distributed. So what do we do? Fortunately, there's this thing called the central limit theorem that is possibly the most important theorem of all statistics. And what the central limit theorem says, this is what it says. <clears throat> 
It says the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal no matter what the distribution of the population is, as long as n is sufficiently large. Okay, and again, you're going to say, what do you mean by sufficiently large? Well, this is what I mean. For just about any population, sufficiently large is going to be about 30. It just works, okay? For more no normally distributed populations, like unimodal and symmetric populations, uh, you can use a much smaller n than 30. If it's normally distributed, you can use an n as small as 2, okay? And if it's unimodal and fairly symmetric looking, an n of 10 will be great. Sometimes smaller than that. So you won't have to do much work at all. Okay? So, uh, now this is, a, this is a very complicated looking slide here. Let me show you what I did. I'm using this program called Fathom. It's a really cool program. And uh, here's our population. Okay? Uh, our population here has a mean of 40, a standard deviation of 10, and, uh, and a population size of 1,000. Okay? And what I did was... And here's, here's our histogram, here's our box plot, so you can get a good idea of what it looks like. And as you can see, it's pretty normally distributed, all right? And what I did was I took a sample size of 25, and then I took a sample size of 25, and I took a sample of 25, and a sample of 25, and a sample of 25, and I did that over and over and over and over and over again, and I got some data over here. And what I found was my, the mean of my uh, sample of 25 was uh, 39.9. Well, the mean over here is 40. That's pretty much the same number. Over here, the standard deviation was 10. And my sample means had a standard deviation of 1.967, so 1.97. Very, very close to 2, which happens to be 10 divided by 5, 5 being the square root of 25. So everything seems to kind of fall in line with what we said would happen. Now, this isn't perfectly normal, just like that's not perfectly normal. But remember, these are, these are, uh, this is not the entire population, okay? Uh, you, the normal model is a model. It's not, you don't get the data that's exactly normal. Okay, so let's look at another distribution here. Again, the mean is 40, the standard deviation is 10, but this time you notice this is skewed, okay? This has got a tail over here to the right. Uh, look, look how many outliers I have. Oh, my God. Uh, so this is definitely a very skewed distribution. But if I take my sample means, and if I do it 500 times, you would never in real life do it 500 times. This is just to show you what the, uh, the model would look like. The skew goes away. Okay? I actually end up with, uh, and this is a sample size of 25. If you remember, the central limit theorem says 30. So this is slightly less than that. Uh, this looks very normally distributed, a very, very symmetric looking box plot, nice bell curve. Uh, the mean is 39.96, basically 40, same mean. The, the standard deviation is 2.01, uh, again, a fifth of 10. So, uh, so this seems to work, whether it's uh, um, symmetric or not. So now let's look at one last one, and this is just a weird, uh, distribution. I decided that I was going to make it bimodal, and I would still have that skew in there, but now it's just kind of crazy looking. And uh, the box plot didn't look that weird, but the histogram definitely looks weird. Uh, again, my population is 40, my standard deviation is 10, and if I look over here at the, uh, the resulting uh, histogram of the sample means, by the way, in case you're looking at this and you're thinking, this looks just as wide as this does, no, no, no. Uh, this is going from about 25 to about 64, 63, okay? This is going from 34 to 46. So the range is much smaller. It's just that my scale is different on this, okay? Uh, but as you can see, it's very, it's, it, it looks fairly normal. It looks very, very symmetric. The mean is 40. The standard deviation is 2 again, just like, uh, just like we predicted it would be. So what the central limit theorem tells us, it's a very, very important theorem. What the central limit tells us, and, it's, and it, it, the reason it's so important is it's really powerful. We don't have to worry about what the distribution is of our population anymore. We don't have to worry if it's normal. We don't have to worry if it's anything. Just choose an n that's big enough, and this will be normal. Okay? All right. That's it for today. Uh, oh, things you shouldn't forget. For the lazy people, 
Pause. Take notes here. You probably didn't take notes before. Do it right now. Done? Good. Next video. Hypothesis testing and the introduction to statistics. To someday I'm going to be able to pronounce that. Statistical inference. Okay? Uh, see you then.